The following program is brought to you through funding from United Technologies Corporation and Cigna. Talcott Mountain Science Center's SciStar Satellite Network presents On the Shoulders of Giants. From the understanding and advancement of nanotechnology to studying interspecies communications, scientists develop new ideas while building upon earlier research. Perhaps in the future, you too will echo Sir Isaac Newton's words, I have seen further because I stood upon the shoulders of giants. Join us to interact with one of today's leaders in science and exploration. Egypt, land of the pharaohs, is a country with over 5,000 years of recorded history and a haven for archaeologists who continue to discover fascinating facts about how the Egyptians lived, built, and died. The Nile was the source of this civilization and provided the water for irrigation and an annual flood that fertilized the land. Today, as in antiquity, the river dominates the landscape, commerce, and daily life. The ancient Greeks considered the Great Pyramid at Giza one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. If they had made a longer list, they might well have included monuments further up the Nile, in the vicinity of Luxor, some 500 kilometers south of Giza, scores of monuments attest to the genius of Egyptian builders and artisans. On the limestone plateau on the western bank of the Nile at Luxor, the ancients selected sites for the burial of the pharaohs and their queens. It is here that our story begins. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, the expeditions of Scaparelli, Belzoni, Carter, and others discovered the tombs of the pharaohs and their consorts. One of the most spectacular is the tomb of Queen Nefertari. Like most of the royal tombs, it was plundered in antiquity, perhaps not long after Nefertari's death. But a series of magnificent paintings is preserved that depicts the queen and the Egyptian deities of the afterlife. Many of these wall paintings had already crumbled to dust when the tomb was discovered in 1903. And since that time, scientists have puzzled over what processes are responsible for their destruction and how to preserve those that remain. Some of the paintings are so deteriorated that the slightest touch would cause them to crumble, while others are among the best preserved examples of Egyptian art. In fact, the problem is so severe that the tomb has been closed to visitors for the last 50 years. Through the efforts of Dr. Farouk Albas, we have enlisted the support of the Boston University Center for Remote Sensing. To all of us involved in this project, this is a wonderful and innovative application of new technologies. When I was uh, first invited to participate in this uh, study, it was to introduce space age technologies to the investigation of the wall paintings of the tomb of Nefertari. First on my agenda was to view the area of the tomb from the perspective of space. So we ordered a uh, Landsat image taken by the thematic mapper of the area and started studying it. The images explain to us much of the geology and the geography of the terrain 
Here we see the channel of the river, Nile, and the green area of the bank around the Nile, which is the fertile valley, surrounded by deserts on either side. From the study of the uh, photograph, we can see that the ancients selected their site well because it is in the desert-like conditions, meaning it is dry, and it is close enough to the uh, Nile Valley, but higher than the floodplain of the Nile. The uh, study of the image also told us about the general terrain in that there are several sets of fractures in here. One set is east-west, one set is northeast, southwest, and the other in the opposite direction, northwest, southeast. This structure also conveys to us that this part right here is an escarpment that is parallel to the major escarpment that bounds the Nile Valley. And it is here that we have to concentrate our studies. And here I am, live on Talcott Mountain in the Science Center. And uh, joining me is your own host, Dr. Donald LaSalle, a great friend of mine, an accomplished biologist, who will introduce the show for today. Thank you, Farouk. And we enjoyed watching your alter ego on that wonderful video <laughs> Thank you. Uh, from, from Boston, where I, you've established the remote sensing labs. And uh, we're really pleased. I think it's been several years since you were here last, yes. three or four years at least. But we have exciting new information for our viewers today, and I think you're in for a real treat when you hear and see some of the tremendous and the most exciting exploits of Dr. Farouk Elbaz. Also joining us today is a familiar face to all of you, is the curriculum coordinator who writes all those wonderful student guides that you get, <laughs> and dean of our academy, Lydia Gibb. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you, Don. I'm so happy to be here again and happy that Dr. Elbaz could join us again uh, Thank you. with all this exciting new remote sensing information. My pleasure. Well, we, we also said that as soon as we came back from the initial video that uh, we would take a few calls and uh, we'll entertain some calls from students who we hope have had their appetite whetted uh, by seeing uh, the beginning of this adventure today. And uh, here is a chance to talk to the gentleman who is on the cutting edge and the forefront of this exciting use of technology in the exploration of old civilizations. Dr. Del Baz, we're going to sit back and, and listen to you. And I know you have some slides. And then we have yes. the video that you're going to show us later of, of the, the, the latest exploits in the tomb yes. of Nefertari. Yes, but maybe I should uh, begin by saying what is remote sensing, because uh, you introduced me as, first uh, <laughs> as the director of the Center for Remote Sensing, and some of our young listeners might not know uh, this good. word. And uh, remote sensing is uh, studying something without having to touch it. So when mm -hmm. I go to the doctor mm -hmm. and he looks at my chest by x-rays, he is really using remote sensing methods mm -hmm. because he has a black box that sends out uh, x-rays towards my chest and then he sees the uh, film that's on back of my uh, chest and the film records the effect of the radiation that is going through my chest. So the doctor is using a black box which is the remote sensing instrument and then he takes up the, fine, the film and he looks at it behind the light and then he starts to interpret what he sees in my chest to tell me that I'm, I'm okay. And that is uh, remote sensing methodology. So remote sensing is really studying from a distance without having to touch the object. And this we do whether we're looking from space or very close to the ground to figure out the, un the, the, uh, the layering beneath the surface of the earth or to see whether there are chambers hidden beneath the earth. Well, that was an excellent explanation, and somewhat like astronomy, where we, we don't normally touch anything. We're seeing things by optical instruments here on Earth. You're looking at things from above or out of the Earth's atmosphere back down at Earth. Very much so, and the astronauts during the, uh, the early Apollo uh, years used to call it, uh, to call astronomy, because we're looking at the stars, we call astronomy eyeballs up. 
<laughs> and then when we're looking at the Earth, they say, well, put the spacecraft attitude, attitude in eyeballs down. Eyeballs down. So it is really just whether you're looking up or looking down, but you're using the same kinds of methods uh -huh. and uh, techniques. Once one of our astronomers described astronomy as being like a great big soccer game, and you never get to touch or put your foot on the ball, so yes. to speak. <laughs> well, you've already inspired some calls that we're going to take from our students. We have Matthew from Torrington, Connecticut. Matthew, uh, we're ready for your call for Dr. Albaz. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Um, I was wondering, what was your most exciting discovery ever? Perhaps the uh, most discover exciting discovery ever as far as archaeology is concerned, and particularly in Egypt, which is called Egyptology, is the discovery of the tomb of King Tut, uh, basically because everything was found intact. Nobody had ever entered the tomb before. So we saw all the things that the ancient Egyptians had left with the young king. That was certainly exciting. But there, I don't know how you could almost single out. I guess that was a wonderful experience. But you've had so many exciting experiences that we're going to hear about. And uh, since we've known a little bit about it, and students should read not only the National Geographic, but uh, this nice issue that you were kind enough to autograph of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which has an article on your present works. So we'll save that a little for later. It was a very good call. And now we have both Tina and Richard calling from Putnam, Connecticut. So we're getting our first Connecticut calls in early, sort of like the election results. Yes. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Tina and Richard from Putnam. We're ready for your call, Tina and Richard. What was the most interesting artifact you saw while on your expedition? Uh, the most uh, interesting artifact that I saw myself was the, uh, the disassembled boat that we uh, photographed at the base of the Great Pyramid. And actually, on this program, we're going to show you that, and you will see the excitement yourself. Mm. Excellent, Tina and Richard. And I hope you stay tuned, because we're going to go back to that exciting video now, and we hope that you'll have more questions a little later on in the program. So we're back to your archaeological findings, and let's go ahead. Yeah, we will continue with the Nefertari story. Salt found embedded in the bedrock surrounding the tomb. The salt, contained in fractures in the limestone, was dissolved and recrystallized behind the plaster layer as well as on top of the paintings. Understanding when and why this process occurred has become the focus for much of the investigation. Dr. Omar El Arini, representative of the Egyptian Antiquities Organization, is also leading the study of the chemical processes affecting the tomb paintings. Here, Dr. El Arini is discussing several possible theories with Christopher Baldwin, Paul Struther, and Amber Soames of Boston University. The dominant crystal form in the lower tombs is sodium chloride. The sodium chloride. And then as you go yes. up, it goes into this, gypsum this and is, then into nothing. This is definitely uh, the case. Uh, but the mode of occurrence of both the gypsum and uh, sodium chloride uh, is the same fibrous uh, crystals growing uh, perpendicularly uh, to the plane of the joints. That, that order of, of uh, sodium chloride and gypsum is re the reverse order of, order of crystallization. You'd expect the gypsum, the sulfates, to be out first, and, and then, the, halides, then the, the halides to come after that. Then you go into the odd, weird trona minerals, yeah. potassium minerals, and uh, so on. This is true, but... Uh, this is one of the questions we have to answer, yeah. we have to find the answer. The, yeah, that would imply... If, if As geologists studied the area of the tomb more closely, it became clear that the immediate area is bound by two major fractures, one on each side. The rock between the two fractures dropped, and this is where the ancients dug the tomb. The joints function as channelways for water and lead directly to the location of the tomb. To fully understand the role of the joints as channelways, it is essential to work from a detailed topographic map. Teams of Earthwatch volunteers 
have been organized to measure the surface elevations of the area surrounding the tomb, and the data will be used to make a computer-generated model of the hydrology. <laughs> a second application of remote sensing methodologies is the comparison of photographs of the paintings taken at different times to see the extent of deterioration in recent times. Here at the Boston University Center for Remote Sensing, photographs of the wall paintings taken in 1904 are compared to other series taken in the 20s, 50s, 70s, and by the present study team in 1986. The third application Hi, Lydia. Question for you for Dr. Elbaz. So yeah. what would your students say if they had an opportunity to ask a question on the air now? Oh, I think they'd be very, very excited. And uh, I know one of uh, the questions that they have is, that what are the techniques used for remote sensing? You were mentioning x-rays. Uh, are x-rays one of the things that you use? Or? That is really an excellent question, Lydia, because uh, and I have been asked that question with many uh, students before. And we really use uh, different uh, techniques depending on the different uh, setting. Because when you have a uh, solid rock layer, then you use a different kind of instrument. And when you have sand, you use a different instrument and so on. And the kinds of things that we use as the uh, a magnetometer that measures the magnetic field of the Earth, a oh, ground penetrating okay. radar that actually sends radar rays towards the ground and receives the reflections back. We also have uh, used uh, seismometers that measure the seismicity, meaning the shaking of the, uh, on the Earth's uh, surface. So we really use the different instrument depending on the, on the setting and the, the geology of the terrain, depending on the rock, the thickness of the rock, the soil, and the kind of soil on the, uh, on the surface. So it, it really de de depends on the site and the area and also the natural uh, setting. So that, and sometimes we find ourselves having to use a mix of instruments. Mm -hmm. You were telling us before that uh, you used one technique in the desert which wasn't supposed to work. Yes. But uh, by a happy accident or serendipity, you actually found uh, sources of water. <laughs> yes, uh, very much so. And that was really a, a, a stunning uh, result for us because nobody expected this at all when we used on the space shuttle a, an imaging radar that sent uh, rays towards the ground and then received the reflections back. And what we uh, found out is that the radar uh, actually penetrated through the uh, sand cover and showed us the courses of ancient rivers that had long since been covered by sand. And mm -hmm. investigating the area, we found out that there must have been a great deal of water. And when we drilled for uh, wells in the area, we found an enormous amount of water mm. that is good for agriculture for many years. So now they're farming in the desert because of this remote sensing. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to come back to some more questions about that, but now we have uh, Tamara Nelson Marr from the National Science Center in Fort Gordon, Georgia on the line. So go ahead, Tamara. Or Tamara. Tamara. Good afternoon. Hello there. Uh, Dr. Elbaz, my question for you is when you uh, saw King Tut's tomb versus the tomb of Queen Nefertari, what were the differences in the deterioration of the artifacts in the tomb mm. that you saw in Queen Nefertari's tomb? And why were, was that deterioration? Why mm. did that occur? Excellent question. Excellent question. Mm. And uh, there is a great deal of difference. First, the, uh, the tomb of Nefertari being a queen and uh, from older time than uh, King Tut, her tomb paintings were a lot more fabulous. They were really magnificent. She was always shown on the wall of the tomb wearing a uh, kind of a see-through cotton uh, dress that is very elegantly tied together and so on. And her makeup is so beautiful and magnificent. So the paintings were more feminine than in the King Tut's uh, tomb. King Tut's tomb was mostly funerary scenes. But in, uh, in the, the tomb of Queen Nefertari, there was a lot of more gaiety and a lot of more femininity, a lot nicer colors and so on. And uh, the, uh, the differences in the duration we are, is the cause for our studies by, of this tomb by remote sensing. So we didn't really know why the uh, difference in the duration, and that's what we went out to study. 
Excellent question, Tamara. Stay on for a second. Uh, I would like to know, and perhaps our listeners, what was the difference in the time span between King Tut and Nefertari? Are you talking a few thousand years? Not a few uh, only about 350 years. Oh, I yes. see. Yes, yeah. Not a huge uh, mm -hmm. span of time, but uh, the king, uh, King Tut, was king for only nine years, a short period of time. And uh, Nefer, uh, Nefertari was queen for a very long period of time because uh, her, uh, she was the queen of the uh, pharaoh that lived for the longest, uh, reigned for the longest period of time. He was king uh, for 67 years, mm -hmm. uh, Ramses the Great. Ramses yeah. the Great. Mm -hmm. uh, Tamara, are you still on? Yes, I am. Yeah, uh, well, I was curious. Do, do you think uh, you could tell us or give an educated guess as to what the name Nefertari means? <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, good for you. Oh, yeah, good, good. Close, close. The uh, part of the name that is Nefer means beauty. And you said beautiful wow. flower. So Nefertari is really the, uh, the self-generating beauty. And her namesake that most people are familiar with, Nefertiti, mm -hmm. uh, her name means the beautiful one. So you got the beauty correct. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Tamara. Okay, you have a nice afternoon. Uh, yes. Same to you. And now we have uh, Rich from Putnam, Connecticut. Rich, go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Rich Pringle from Putnam. Hello, what Rich. What the most and least valuable artifacts you have discovered, and how much were they worth? <laughs> They're worth, yes. The, uh, I would say that the most uh, valuable artifact that we discovered is, again, this uh, boat that was that is still buried under the base of the Great Pyramid in Egypt, which we are going to show you uh, soon. And the uh, value, the, the money that uh, we would say, how much would that uh, cost or what would it be uh, valuable, valued at, it is uh, totally and completely unmanageable. It's a sum of money that we can't even count. Mm. And you can't take it out and it sell it anyway. Yes. So none of the artifacts are, can be sold. They're the property of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Hello. I'm Nicole. And um, my question is, was there anything found on the ship? Uh, very good question, Nicole. The ship was disassembled. We did not uh, uh, take it out yet, but there was one other ship that was taken out and assembled in a museum, and uh, nothing else was found in addition to the wood itself and the rope that used to tie the pieces of the wood together to make the ship. So these ships did not have a single nail, pieces of wood fit together, and they were tied by rope. And that's all that was found. There was nothing on top. That's why, to this day, we don't know what these ships were used for. Yeah, mm. excellent. We'll take one more call and return to our video clip. Uh, Janelle or Janelle from Torrington, Connecticut. Go ahead, please. Um, do you want to find what you're looking for? <laughs> ah, good question. <laughs> sometimes no. you don't know what no, you're looking for. Sometimes you don't really know what you're looking for. Sometimes you know that there is an area that people have lived there and you don't have the slightest notion where they did they really live and where do you begin to dig and that's what we're saying that remote sensing can help in this uh, situation whereby you can go to a site and use these instruments to figure out whether there may be something buried down there or not and many times you go and you study and you work and you find nothing so and mm -hmm. sometimes in the area where people have found nothing you find something. Mm -hmm. That's why we think there will be other things for you to find out when you grow up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a good question because sometimes in, in scientific exper experimentation, even negative results are meaningful. Yes. Uh, we do want to return to the video now and then we'll take some more calls. This is getting the plot is yes. thickening and uh, <laughs> uh, we're ready to return to the video. The third application of remote sensing technology is a study of the wall paintings using a multi-spectral camera, an infrared sensor, and an ultraviolet sensor. This task was undertaken by Fritz Hemans of the Center for Archaeological Studies and the Center for Remote Sensing at Boston University, and Peter von Thuna of Arthur D. Little Corporation. Here, Peter is taking measurements with the infrared camera of an area that is especially damaged by the salt. This pair of images shows one of the paintings in ultraviolet light and on the right in infrared. 
the enhanced ultraviolet image clearly shows the sketches outlining the figure, which were made by the artist before color was applied. Analyses of images from these specialized sensors are underway that show variations in the reflectance properties of the wall materials resulting from various degrees of deterioration. The results help to point out the places that need emergency treatment. How can these magnificent paintings be preserved? Well, the use of remote sensing technologies is directed at a better understanding of the problem of salt crystallization and the deterioration of the paintings. Each of the scientists involved brings special expertise and a different point of view to the project. The multidisciplinary research and discussions between the scientists will lead to a set of recommendations for the preservation of the wall paintings. When the conservation effort is completed, the wall paintings will be made available for people to see and enjoy in this great monument to the artistry of the ancient Egyptians. Well, an interesting question came up this morning from one of our students live here, Dr. Elbaz. These paintings, the colors were still so vivid after yes. centuries. What was the technique? What kinds of paints and what did they paint on? Was it like a fresco painting that we're familiar with today? It was a good question because the colors are so incredibly beautiful and as if they were just applied yesterday. The ancient Egyptians dug out the hollow uh, to make the, uh, the tomb and then they covered the wall with plaster so it will be smooth for them to uh, paint on. And they brought rocks, different kinds of rocks, and they ground them and uh, wetted them and they applied them with brush. So all of the paintings that you see are actually natural rocks and minerals that have been powdered and applied to the, uh, mm -hmm. to the wall using uh, either glue or they also used eggs to, to make oh. the, the uh, powder <laughs> stick to the wall. Ah. Oh but, and then because it was encased and entombed, so to speak, for centuries, the outside air did not get to it? That's or? correct. And no dust and no wind and so on. And everything mm -hmm. is still intact the way they left it. And the colors are so uh, pure and clean that uh, it's just amazing when you enter mm -hmm. a place and see the, the colors so fresh. Well. We have my friend Amy from Mentor, Ohio on the line, and we're ready for a question from Amy. Um, do you believe in the curses of spirits that supposedly haunt these ruins? The <laughs> curses of uh, the, the, the dead, the, yeah. The curses of the spirits that yes. haunt these areas. Yes. Yeah. Well, Certainly. Halloween is over, but we still got we, some spirits flying yeah, around. Yeah, there is absolutely no reason to believe that they don't exist. So <laughs> we... We do this very carefully, and uh, every time something goes wrong, we joke about it and we say, it's the curse of the pharaohs. <laughs> Good question. Uh, Sean uh, from Tarrington, we're ready for your call, Sean. How, how is the seal able to be made to air inside a tomb different from the air we breathe? Yes, you're going to see that uh, very soon on the uh, film that we will show uh, next, so uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Some of these questions are really anticipating what's coming up, and we hope we'll be able to show that. Uh, we have uh, Tori with a call from Putnam. Uh, Tori, go ahead. Were you scared or worried that something might happen to you while in these tombs? Yes, you actually uh, are, and uh, the first time you enter any of these tombs, it is the temperatures are so different from the outside, and it is humid, and it is dark. And sometimes it is, takes you so many steps or uh, to, to by the time to get down. So there is really a, a feeling of apprehension when you enter these places. And don't forget that they were burial sites. So there is a great deal mm -hmm. of, of respect and apprehension before you get into these things. And actually, this adds to the intrigue mm -hmm. of entering mm -hmm. the tomb, too. Any, mm -hmm. any significant uh, aromas or staleness to the air? No, they actually, uh, they don't have uh, stillness, but it is, uh, it is the, the, the feeling that you are entered a moist place as compared to the incredible dryness outside. Have we done a chemical analysis? Do we know what the mixture is? Is there any more or less of, of the air? one gas or yes, another? Yes, yes, and we found out, for instance, in the tomb, uh, of the, or the tomb of the, of the boat, mm -hmm. that uh, the carbon dioxide is twice as much twice as, as much. it is uh, uh, outside, in, uh, outside mm -hmm. air, and 
uh, mm. there is also there is lack of oxygen inside so mm -hmm. there may be an oxygen eating bacteria inside which we don't really understand it to uh, this day. We'll yeah. have to come back to that. It's an interesting story, yeah. Stay we're, tuned. We're ready to... Re <laughs> yes, we will. Uh, yeah, a lot of things we didn't ask you about. We're ready to return now to the video. Uh, go ahead. On the outskirts of the modern city of Cairo stands one of the most famous and mysterious monuments in the world the Great Pyramid at Giza. It was built by the Pharaoh Khufu, sometimes called Cheops, around 2600 BC. In the centuries which followed, these weathered stones, two and a half million of them, have revealed their secrets slowly, piece by piece. No one really knows why the ancient Egyptians erected these massive structures, but tantalizing clues keep turning up. And sometimes they take the form of buried treasure. In 1954, an underground vault was discovered beneath these capstones near the pyramid's southern base. Inside the vault, explorers found the remains of a boat, a very big boat. I remember seeing the problem. Farouk El Baz remembers the stir the find caused. The news of the day said that we had found a ship uh, that's kind of the funerary boat when they removed the Pharaoh westward, sailing westward with the, uh, with the, the, with the sun so that he'd be buried in uh, this place. And a lot of people expected, aha, now they're going to find his body, the mummy, because the uh, Kufu's mummy had never been found. <laughs> Tuhami Mahmoud Ali was foreman of the work crew in charge of the excavation. I was delighted because we had found a uh, ship, and the likes of which didn't exist anywhere in the world. Tuhami was among the first men to enter the vault in nearly 50 centuries. But instead of the pharaoh's mummy, they found a completely disassembled ship 1,224 pieces of polished cedar, arranged in the words of one observer, like parts of a toy model. It took 13 years of painstaking labor to put the boat back together. The old shipbuilding techniques, like hand tying planks to the rails, were scrupulously followed. Naval historians say the boat is an engineering feat in wood, as impressive in its own way as the pyramids are in stone. But even as the vessel took shape, experts disagreed about how it had originally been used. Some said it was simply a funeral barge. Others believed it was a ship for the pharaoh in his afterlife. Hieroglyphs from the nearby pyramid of Unas suggest that a pharaoh was expected to sail two boats, one during the day and one at night, as he followed the sun throughout eternity. Other reliefs, like these on the walls of the tomb of T, provide documentary evidence of the importance of boat traffic on the River Nile, but shed little further light on the debate except to show us how the ancient boats were made. But whatever its use, the 142-foot vessel must have made quite an impression then, as it does today. It is the oldest ship in the world. in its own museum, Khufu's boat attracts some 200,000 visitors a year. For the anchor, the anchor, and the big one, 
to go to push it away ah, oui, from la... the bank. Ouais, ouais. Mm? But this is small cabin for the captain. Oui. And this uh, the big cabin for the mummy of Kiosk. Oui. This is all cedar, cedar wood. 34 years later, scientists are preparing to examine the contents of a second underground chamber, discovered a stone's throw away from the first. But this time, there are no plans to excavate it. Because I bet if we measure from the Dr. El Baz, director of Boston University's Center for Remote Sensing, and a team of scientists sponsored by the National Geographic Society begin the operation with ground-penetrating radar, which has provided a rough map of shapes below the surface. This space-age approach is helping to solve one of archaeology's thorniest problems, how to explore a site without destroying it. The only digging involved will be scraping away a few feet of loose earth from one of the enormous capstones covering the pit. So archaeology is no longer a uh, grave, uh, grave uh, robbing uh, activity or uh, a uh, destruction, a way of destroying things until you get the artifacts. It's not because the, the site itself might be an artifact to keep it intact the way the ancients had left it. So this is really getting a, 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 a way of departing from the, uh, the archaeology the way it was. And we are just opening a whole new way that might apply in, in many other fields. Well. Fantastic, and I, I'm so impressed with the size of that boat. One of the students this morning asked you about its length, and I uh, wonder if you could repeat that for us. Yes, the, it is 140 feet uh, long, and uh, it is really uh, larger than any of the Viking ships that made oh. it from Europe all the way to America. So it is really a, a huge boat, even though it is the oldest boat in the world to this day, oh. uh, because it is 4,600 years old. Lydia, would you assume that with a boat this size that they went f further than the Nile or the Mediterranean? Or? Well, I don't know. I guess that was one of my questions. Was, yes. was this boat ever used, and can you tell? Or? Yeah, this boat uh, was used on the yes, Nile, not uh, beyond that, because we, we actually see at a at given level within inside of the boat, when you go inside it, uh -huh. mm -hmm. you find that the, uh, the rope that was used to tie the wood has made left marks on the wood until a certain size, until mm -hmm. a certain level. So we know it has been uh, used uh, on the Nile, whether it would tr actually transported Pharaoh's mummy westward with the sun, mm -hmm. or whether it was used just to, to cross from the east to the west and then disassembled and then put on the uh, pyramid plateau. We don't know, but, but we know that has floated on water before. Hmm. That would be some yeah. portage carrying yes. a boat. Uh, we, we've had Megan patiently waiting from Cincinnati, Ohio, and we're ready to take that call now. Go ahead, Megan. I was wondering, <clears throat> I was wondering what happened to Queen Nefertiti's mummy? Uh, with the, uh, the, the, the mummy of uh, Queen Nefertari was never found, uh, Megan. We did find hmm. the uh, the mummy of uh, her husband, uh, Ramses the Great, and that mummy is now in stored in the museum in, uh, in Egypt, and it's one of the most well-preserved mummies. You can still he, see his fingernails, you still he, see a, a great deal mm. of his hair, and you know that his, he, he was a red-headed uh, man because his hair is a little red, and. Uh, and even the, uh, uh, all of the hair on his face, you can still see some of that, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the queen's mummy was never found. Wow, excellent mm -hmm. question. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we'll take Raymond from New Haven, Connecticut. Raymond, go ahead. Raymond, we're ready for your call. Uh, hello, okay. Hello, my name is Raymond Dawson from Cute Magnet Academy. Hi. And my question is, when you repair the beautiful murals that you have at the Academy, do you use ancient ancient formulas or modern-day materials? Uh, when we, uh, actually, we said that uh, one of the most important things is not to touch the paintings at all, not to retouch them, not to complete the paintings. We wanted the paintings to be as ancient as they were, because as soon as you add anything new, you actually mm -hmm. destroy the archaeological value of the painting. So when we said that uh, this uh, painting or the wall mu uh, mural was going to be uh, renovated or or preserved or conserved, that means we're just going to clean it 
and leave it the way it is, even though it has missing pieces, you don't complete them. Because if you complete them, then you have lost some of its of their original value. Excellent question, mm -hmm. Rihanna. Mm -hmm. One la quick call from Carrie in Mentor, Ohio, and then back to our video portion. Carrie, go ahead. Do the artifacts you find go to the museum, or do they? In the tomb. Excellent question, uh, Carrie. Because in the in the case of the uh, of the boat, we had left everything intact the way it is because we said that the the uh, the, the boat, as as we see it uh, disassembled in its site, that might actually be part of its value. We see it the way the ancient Egyptians left it. So we left it in there mm -hmm. as if untouched. And uh, other things, of course, when they are taken out of context, we put them in the museum. But in this case, we decided to leave the boat where it is. Excellent questions. And now back to the exciting conclusion of yes. this expedition. Is drilling a small hole through the six foot thick capstone into the vault. But it must be an airtight hole. When the first chamber was opened in 1954, the air inside was still heavy with the smell of cedar. So there is a chance the air in this vault has been trapped there for over 46 centuries, an invaluable scientific find. Bob Moores of Black & Decker developed a sophisticated airlock that will make sure new and old air don't mingle. Anchored to the rock is a system of O-rings and backup seals. The drill will move through the limestone at the rate of about four inches an hour, with frequent pauses to remove dust and debris. Moore's unique design then allows the hole to be closed, while other instruments are inserted. Inside the vault, air samples will be collected and tested for traces of modern air pollutants. If none are found, it might explain why the first ship was so well preserved. Peter Tons of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration will supervise the sampling procedures. The boat in the adjacent pit to this one <clears throat> uh, was extremely well preserved for 4,600 years. And from what I've heard, it has deteriorated more in the past 20 years than in the previous 4,600. So the Egyptians are not very keen on opening this pit and getting the boat out, or if there's a boat in there, of course, and then have it crumble. So they would uh, like to see what's in there, what it's like in there, and then seal the hole back up. The drilling operation consumes one full day and another. Then, midway through the third day, Bob Moore's drill moves through the last few millimeters of stone. Now it is time for the rest of the team to go to work. Peter Tons will draw about 70 liters of air from the vault. Are you going to take any samples for the... Yeah. Since the results of the analysis won't be available for months, Tons decides to perform a less scientific examination on the spot. It smells stale. Thanks. It smells stale, guys. No, definitely doesn't smell, does not smell like cedar. Absolutely not. It is nearly midnight before the photographers get their turn. The long black tube is part of the special video system designed by Pete Patrone of National Geographic. What is, what is monitor to look like, anybody? In order not to affect the temperature inside the vault, a heatless lamp will provide the light. As the camera begins its slow descent through the hole, 
Everyone gathers around a TV monitor to catch a first glimpse of things that haven't been seen for nearly 5,000 years. An eerie shower of drilling dust signals the camera's entrance into the space which has waited so long in darkness. <laughs> oh, nice! God bless Gertie! Hey, okay, you're right. It is a boat. Yeah. That's not dirty laundry. Look at all that stuff on top. Well, it comes from the ceiling, I think. Ooh. Pieces, pieces of limestone. I guess. Oh, right. Doesn't, don't you think? It does look like pieces that flaked off the, maybe the sealer. Gypsum sealer. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Pieces. Tuhami has no doubt that he is looking at the pieces of a second ship. The camera shows a notched beam that supported the deckhouse roof, a valuable clue to the length of the ship. Other angles reveal a copper fitting, a stonemason's ancient calculations. Experts believe each piece is part of a ship very much like the first, though perhaps a bit smaller. The obvious damage inside the vault may be due to a brick-making machine used to build a museum for the first ship. It stood directly above this second chamber, vibrating and dripping water. Other details seem to confirm this hypothesis wet-looking patches in the roof where plaster has fallen. A pair of ghostly oar blades, warped by moisture. No, drop down. And then, something unexpected. Well, Peter! Quick! Come on, Tim! Yeah. 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 That is great! Yeah. 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 <laughs> How else could the beetle live? You know, I mean, he has to be, he has to be, uh, has to be breathing air. So if we have a live beetle, that means we don't have 4,000 year old air. Whatever the results are, bad or good, if they're scientific, that's what we tried to do. We tried to find out. And we did find out there's something living down there. After taking samples of the air and after looking at it, we know that we have not disturbed the site at all. So this is kind of a starting a whole new, uh, opening a whole new door to uh, technology. And I personally believe that this might uh, be a, a, a new change to the archaeological exploration, very much like what uh, age dating did to archaeology earlier in this century. Good. Age dating propelled archaeology from a collector's pastime into a more exact science. Video exploration promises to extend its reach into realms that have always seemed impenetrable. Until now. And for now, at least, there are no plans to restore the pharaoh's second ship. Soon the camera will be withdrawn, the hole in the stone resealed. Instead of seeing the vessel in all her original glory, visitors will have to imagine what it might have looked like, bearing the pharaoh down the Nile, or even perhaps through the afterlife, in his relentless pursuit of the sun. Wow, so exciting. I don't think I can close this program, Lydia. I'm going to have to ask you to do it. <laughs> Farouk, the curse of the pharaohs. Yes, right. You were bugged. That is right. uh, total surprise, yes. wasn't it? The Beatles beat us. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the curse of the pharaoh that uh, our listener asked about earlier. Here it is.
<laughs> oh, boy. Susan from Putnam, Connecticut. And then uh, we have a couple of slides that we'd like you to show, and we'll yeah. come back to the end of the program. Susan, we're ready for your call. Hi, this is Susan O'Connor. Um, I was wondering, what was your reaction when you found the boat under the um, Great Pyramid of Giza? It was really a, uh, a, a great reaction because of the fact that we have found something that uh, uh, had been uh, stored there for 4,600 years, and uh, so it's something new, and we saw it in all of its uh, splendor, all the pieces of wood there intact, the way the ancient Egyptians left it so many years ago. So it was a wonderful feeling. Um, we have one more question. Sure. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, this is Pat from Putnam also. My question is, what was the first artifact you discovered? Ah, the first artifact that I discovered was a piece of bone from a, uh, a trip that I took with the scouts, the Boy Scouts, in a mountain near Cairo. I was uh, a boy, maybe about uh, mm -hmm. uh, seven years old, maybe not too <laughs> old, much older or younger than you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you started young. Well, uh, again, I'm still fascinated about all that wonderful effort in high tech, and we find a living organism down there. But we want to show you slides. A couple of slides are ready, and we'll take uh, some yeah. remaining calls, Lydia, and then you can tell us about our next exciting presenter in a few weeks. The, uh, the picture that we see right now is, is that of the bricks, the pieces of blocks of uh, limestone that uh, were on top of the first uh, chamber that they, from which they took a boat just like the one that we discovered. And you can see there is a man on the left side there that shows you how large these uh, blocks are. Mm -hmm. And inside, when the archaeologists first found the first boat, they found that the pieces of wood that were supposed to fit with next to each other were tied together so that the people that would took him out would know how to reassemble the boat. It was a very oh. clever ploy from mm. the ancient Egyptians. They oh, must have known that someday somebody was going to discover them. <laughs> that is correct. Uh, Tim from Mentor, Ohio. Tim, we're ready for your call. How can you translate the paintings? How can you translate the paintings? Yes. Uh -huh. All right, this is really the reading of the script of uh, the, the petroglyphs. Uh, there are all kinds of writings on the, on the walls, and each little figure that you see there means one sound and you put the sounds together and you make words and you put the words together you make history ah. mm. petro meaning rock and the glyphs meaning the writing writing or, or these figures are... figures on the rock so writing. petroglyphs oh. and figures on the rock Very which good. means this is the form of writing that the ancients mm. used to tell us about yeah. their history well we we've ah. covered biology uh, high technology archaeology art uh, language arts yes. it's mm. been an absolutely fascinating program mm -hmm. kathy from cincinnati ohio do you happen to know how the Egyptians died off? How the Egyptians? What was the last part, Kathy? How they did what? Died off. Ah, oh, how the Egyptians died. They died very much like us today. But the, uh, the uh, people that were elevated in the society and the people from the government and, and the pharaohs and so on were all mummified. We don't really know how the, the mummification process went through. Mm -hmm. It is still remains one of the great mysteries of, uh, of ancient time. And maybe when you grow up, you can also look into it and find how the Egyptians were able to mummify the bodies to preserve them for all this time for us to see. Mm -hmm. uh, probably an excellent note to close this wonderful dialogue with you and students out as a challenge to them about future areas they may wish to pursue for careers in their adult lifetime. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much from Cincinnati. Uh, Lydia, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the next presenter, and then we will say goodbye to Farouk and thank him once again for sure. being here. Sure. Our uh, next presenter is Stanley Mason on November 26th. And Stanley Mason is uh, a very famous inventor, inventor of the form-fitting disposable diapers and masonware cookware for the microwave oven. And I think you'll find his presentation very fascinating. And we also have on November 10th, George Megan, uh, the man who has walked the furthest from the tip of South America to Alaska. And hope you'll join us then um, for that very exciting presentation. Well, very good. And we'll even give you a little clue into next spring when we'll have Dr. Max Matthews right. from Stanford, mm -hmm. who is uh, the pioneer in, in uh, new kinds of audio sounds and mm -hmm. digital CD. And then Roger Payne, who has recorded the voices of whales, and uh, you, you probably uh, yes, come across him in your National Wonderful. Geographic Good. travels. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I'd like to yeah. remind everybody that we'll still take phone calls after we go off the air. If you didn't get your question answered uh, on today's television program, uh, call after the show. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, whoever follows this program, Farouk, is going to have a, a formidable <laughs> task. Uh, I think